Hey there guys, alright, today we are back with some History Matters, this time 10 Minute History, the Austro-Hungarian Empire short documentary. Um, I apologize for the, I guess, mic, well, yeah, mic issues the past uh, few videos. I think I have it figured out now. I don't know why my recording software, whenever, like, my PC restarts, does an update, or I shut it off, it starts to mess decides not to uh, work with the settings that it had previously, and so I have to mess with it again. Now, it's not every time I restart or shut down my PC, just like when I guess there's like a... I don't know, it's, it's very sporadic. I don't get it. Um, anyways, uh, just a couple things to say before we get into the video. Remember to go check out the links down below. Uh, the two most important links, in my opinion, are the links to my gaming channel, which... Um, is where I upload my Twitch VODs, my old Twitch streams. Um, and currently, that's what's being uploaded is the Mass Effect 3 playthrough. Uh, and then the next, um, probably most important link, in my opinion, is the Twitch link to my Twitch channel, where I am currently streaming Ghost of Tsushima and Divinity 2, or Divinity Original Sin 2. Make sure to go check those out, give me a follow on Twitch, and subscribe to my gaming channel. All right. Enough of that, let's go ahead, dive into the video. 1848, and the Austrian Empire is having some trouble. This Sounds about right for the Austrian-Hungarian army. Trouble occurred Empire. on March the 13th in Vienna when a crowd mostly made up of students rights, please. demanded more rights and the government obliged by shooting them, <laughs> which led to riots. This riot was part of the larger trend of revolutions which swept across Europe in 1848. To oversimplify, they were largely concerned with Many revolutionaries wanted to build new nations along ethnic lines. This threatened to break up the Austrian Empire. Yes, this is... <sighs> the best example it could be is like kind of a mini... mini French Revolution kind of thing happening. Uh, revolutions just attempting to be like the French Revolution, the original French Revolution's goals, which was overthrow... Well, not really. The original Revolution's goals wasn't to overthrow the monarchy, it was to get rights. And stuff and put a limit on uh, absolute monarchy but then later on it evolved into getting rid of the monarchy these were also like somewhat similar to that i believe of wanting to overthrow the monarchy um i don't know if all of them were like or maybe they were also like just trying to break up the authority of the king of the crown and just get more democracy and constitutional governments installed that I'm not too certain about, but uh, yeah, these were kind of a few decades later, but offshoots of, I kind of look, of them, look at them as offshoots of, uh, as part of the feelings that the French Revolution left behind. With improving the working lives of the peasantry, increasing democratic representation, and in many cases wanted to form states along national, ethnic, and linguistic lines. Yep. This was bad news for the Austrian Empire since it was very diverse. Yes. It included many ethnic groups such as Germans, Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, Ukrainians, called Ruthenians at the time, Poles known as Galicians, Croats, Serbs, Italians, Romanians, and many, many others. Some of these people wanted better representation and others preferred outright independence. The events of 1848 spread outside of Vienna quickly. On March the 15th, in the city of Pest, revolutionaries demanded extra rights and soon after declared Hungarian independence, but importantly declared that Ferdinand would still be their king. The central government struggled to yeah. respond effectively. This is when, uh, I think right now they are still referred to as the Austrian Empire, and then this event is what causes them, I believe, to... Hungary gets... Closer to equal rights. I don't think they have equal rights as Austria. I don't think they're the same. I don't think they're regarded as the same, uh, even still legally, in all, in this empire. But yeah, it, this is why they become known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I believe. Effectively, and in Italy, the Austrian army withdrew from most of the revolting Italian states. This left them wide open for invasion, which the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia did soon after. The Imperial Army marched into Hungary, was pushed back to Vienna and counterattacked. In December, the Minister President of Austria, Felix Schwarzenberg, persuaded Emperor Ferdinand That's a very Austrian last name. Ferdinand I to abdicate. Ferdinand was succeeded by his nephew, Franz Joseph I, who wanted a strong response and soon after appealed to Russia for help. 
In the, the June of 1849, Russian troops entered Hungary, who had little chance resisting both empires. The Hungarian Revolution was crushed, the invasion of Italy was repulsed, and by 1852, the central government in Vienna had a firm grip over all of its territories. Oh, yeah. Franz Joseph essentially now ruled as Known as a neo-absolutism, it harmed other more liberal nations' views of Austria who saw it as backwards. ...as an absolute monarch, relying on men like Schwarzenberg to enforce his will. Schwarzenberg was an exceptional statesman, but in 1852 his career suffered a slight setback when he died. Oh! So Austria... That do be a slight setback, don't worry, I think he can make a comeback though. Austria was indebted to Russia for its help with putting down the Hungarian revolt, and Russia expected help in return. You owe Russia us. asked for this during the Crimean help, War, but Austria refused, no. and the war was a Russian defeat. Austria's refusal to aid Russia meant that relations between the two soured hugely, which would eventually Russia remember that. Really have consequences. Porsche. In 1859, the Austrians were goaded into declaring war on Piedmont Sardinia, who the French quickly came to the aid of. Long story short, the Austrians lost and surrendered Lombardy, the empire's wealthiest province, to Piedmont Sardinia. Furthermore, the financial strains of war meant that the banking sector collapsed. The banks were in trouble before the war started. The bankers refused to lend to the government until it was more stable. And with it, the government. The bankers refused to loan any more money until a constitution was created, and so Franz Joseph begrudgingly chose to begin reforms. These Hold on, can we also... The, the, the fact that uh, Lombardy... Lombardy? I don't even want to pronounce it. Uh, was the most uh, valuable province in the empire. I never see that as a good sign for an empire when the... Now, of course, this is different when it's an overseas empire, right? For Britain, the crown jewel was India. And India was certainly profitable. However, the goods made in India would go like to Britain, be made, manufactured. You know, it, it was a different relationship here. Um... But like when, when your most valuable province is not a province that is made up of, you know, the, the domestic, I guess, national culture. So, again, going on these ethnic lines for the Austro-Hungarian Empire, this would be Austria and Hungary. More specifically, Austria, as that was the center of the government. Um... The fact that Austria is not home to the most profitable province kind of, to me, is like that's not going to be a strong empire. That's how I always kind of looked at it, right? Um, and you can kind of say the same thing about Rome, however, because Egypt was probably, I would say, the most profitable province. This is just a weird tangent. And the more I think about it, the more it actually doesn't make sense because Rome lasted quite a while. Anyway. <laughs> reforms culminated in 1861 reform, with I guess. a compromise which frankly pleased no one. Franz Joseph kept his control over military and foreign affairs, but most legislative and bureaucratic powers were transferred to the reformed Imperial Council. The Imperial Council, the Parliament, was split into two right, houses. Right. A house of deputies... Elections which favor the wealthy and the Germans. Makes These sense. which saw representatives elected by a complex system which favoured the wealthy and the Germans, and a House of Lords whose members were appointed by Franz Joseph. The so again favours the wealthy and the Germans. <laughs> the conservatives weren't happy because they'd lost some of their powers, the Liberals weren't happy because they'd gained very little in terms of meaningful reform, and the Emperor wasn't happy because he'd lost quite a bit of his own power. So, having failed in Italy, the Austrians attempted to find better fortune in Germany. This went terribly and ended in Austria losing a war with Prussia in 1866 over some territory in Schleswig-Holstein. The Austrians were defeated because they hadn't adapted to the new technologies and because the Italians had joined the Prussians. Mm. Austria lost Venice but gave it to France because they felt the Italians hadn't earned it before France <laughs> gave it to them anyway. The Austrians were there after- That's my favourite fucking thing of history. One of my favourite little, like, fucking such petty moments in history. Austria is like, no, fuck you, Italy. France, take it. And France is like, Italy, here you go. It's so, so petty. I love it. After excluded from German affairs Hello. and at home, this Get defeat out. was so destabilizing it looked like it could tear the empire apart, and so Franz Joseph desperately tried to compromise with the ever restless Hungarians. This led to the 1867 Ausgleich between the Austrian and Hungarian. Okay, this is where they become Austro Hungarian, right? Halves of the empire, which led to the creation of the dual monarchy better yep. known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay. The empire was split into two, with the Hungarians ruling this area and the Austrians ruling this. 
these two were to be governed as separate entities with different governments and laws. The only oh. thing they shared was a common foreign policy, military and ruler since Franz Joseph was now both the Emperor of Austria and the King of Hungary. The terms okay. of the agreement were to be renegotiated every 10 years. Only economic issues were up for negotiation. Other minorities in the empire wanted similar rights to the Hungarians. Okay, so it kind of was like all these other minorities now want, were like, Prince Joseph, you can be our monarch too. You want rights. You know, that's not a bad idea, bad deal, right? You can say, get an even longer name. You can be Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, King of Croatia, King of Bosnia, King of Serbia. Be king of so many different things instead of just King of Austro Hungary, Emperor of the Austro Hungarian Empire. Be so many, you can have so many titles. Compensate for something. ...years in further ausgleeks, which meant that pressing issues, most importantly army funding, could have the potential of tearing the dual monarchy apart. The other peoples of the empire criticised the agreement Give us more they rights. wanted autonomy too, and many Austrians believed it gave the Hungarians too Mad much power. Are too powerful. To a certain extent, this was kind of true, since during the Franco-Prussian War, Franz Joseph wanted to aid the French, but the Hungarians refused, wanting no part in the war, and so nothing happened except for the unification of Germany. Huh. In 1868, the army was reformed, but compared to the other great powers, Austria-Hungary's military budget was still very small. In Hungary, similar educational reforms were made, but a lot of this was part of the Hungarianization of the kingdom, an attempt to homogenize the languages and identities of the people who lived there by making them Hungarian. Austria-Hungary now turned its attention to the Balkans. After the Ottomans were defeated by the Russian Empire in 1878, Austria-Hungary occupied the province of Bosnia-Herzegovina. This caused an even greater rift with the Russians, who now saw you the Austro-Hungarian Empire as a challenger to its interests in the Balkans. Incidentally, 1878 also marked the year that Pest merged with the neighbouring city of Buda, becoming Budapest. The Liberals didn't nice. back the addition of these new territories, and so the Emperor turned to a man called Edward von Taff, who created a political coalition of minorities known as the Iron Ring. This Ooh. managed to keep That's a fucking badass name. Keep the Liberals out of power and importantly meant that the Empire took a much friendlier position towards its Slavic population. This worried the new German Empire, who wanted a German dominated Austria Hungary. The Chancellor of the German Empire, Otto von Bismarck, wanted to keep the Empire on side and so offered an alliance, the Jewel Alliance, Friends. which would align the two empires and hopefully dissuade Russian I'm old now. Aggression. So Taft began to roll back. He expanded voting rights to all literate males over 24. Nice. Taft also cracked down on the socialist and workers' movements. Not so nice. I mean, understandable, but workers' rights, man. Some of the liberal reforms, such as shortening the length of mandatory education, giving the minorities of the empire, particularly the Czechs, greater autonomy, strengthening the Catholic Church, and passing anti-socialist legislation. The late 19th century was a difficult time for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In 1889, Franz Joseph's son, Crown Prince Rudolf, committed suicide, meaning Franz Joseph... He what now? brother, Karl Ludwig, became heir. Karl Ludwig would catch typhoid in 1898 and die, leaving oh. his son and Franz Joseph's nephew, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, as heir. The question of the minorities continued to plague okay. the empire, and Taft was eventually ousted. His replacement didn't do much better, and so the emperor appointed a man called Casimir Badeni in 1890. Casimir Badeni. That name is, is Polish, definitely. Badeni, though. That sounds Hungarian or maybe Romanian. Five. But Denny attempted to bring about reforms in Bohemia, giving the Czechs greater language rights and autonomy. The Bohemian government was dominated by German speakers who didn't want Czech to be an official language, and so, riots. No, yeah, was makes sense. By... List of people who are unemployed. You. Franz Joseph in 1897, but the problem continued. In Hungary, the Liberals were still in control and continued the process of Hungarianization, which in 1902 spread to the army. The Hungarians wanted their part of the Austrian... They still want people to speak Hungarian, which is reasonable, yeah. The Hungarians did not like the fact that officers were expected to speak German. The use of many languages led to communication issues. I can understand why the Hungarians would be upset about this. However, when your ruler probably also doesn't speak... Like, the supreme commander of the army is going to be the emperor. So, when the emperor himself probably does not speak Hungarian, I feel like it's reasonable that officers would also then be expected to speak German. Because that's the language the emperor speaks. Austro-Hungarian army to speak Hungarian instead of German. Franz Joseph did not like this, and after a great deal of arguing and threats, the army remained unreformed. 
At this point, the empire was rapidly industrialising, and even though it wasn't at the same level as, say, Britain or France, the areas around Vienna and Prague were very close. In terms of foreign policy, Austria-Hungary took a different approach to the other great powers. It didn't participate in the scramble for Africa and didn't make much of an effort to secure a global empire no simply thanks. because it lacked the navy to protect one. Closer to yeah, home, the no, empire no was navy. worried about being too reliant on Germany and so sought to improve relations with Russia. This went terribly since in 1908 Austria-Hungary annexed Bosnia, which to put it mildly upset the great powers, especially Russia, since they weren't consulted. This meant that the only ally the Austro-Hungarian Empire had left was the German Empire and that the other great powers no longer felt the need to include them in international affairs. Oh. The monarchy's weak position meant its neighbours eyed the territories which included their fellow countrymen and so the empire needed to assert its prestige again, especially in the Balkans. One way of doing this was by sending the heir to the throne, Franz Ferdinand, to Bosnia. As everyone knows, it was here he was assassinated on June yep. the 28th, 1914 at the hands of Gavrilo Princip, a Bosnian Serb who wanted the liberation of all Slavs from Austria-Hungary. The murder of the heir to the He's throne dead. was seen as, to put it mildly, not okay, and so <laughs> Serbia, whose responsibility is debated, had to be punished with war. The decision to go to war was aided by the blank check the German Whatever. Empire had given Franz Joseph, which gave unconditional German backing to any actions he took. Franz Joseph. The murder of Franz Ferdinand was a blow to Habsburg honor. Crushing Serbia would dissuade other countries from wanting Austro-Hungarian territory. Yeah, except uh, you did not crush Serbia. Your army sucks. Was mostly interested in keeping his dynasty's honor intact. He gave Serbia an ultimatum. Serbia said no to some of the terms and so war specifically the First World War. To summarise the war for Austria-Hungary, it went terribly. The army was disorganised yeah. and underfunded, and the empire was filled with political squabbles. When Austria-Hungary did win major battles, it was largely due to the intervention of allies like Bulgaria and especially Germany, who increasingly began to dominate the empire's policies. The many minorities of the empire, with some outside help, began to demand independence, and this threatened to tear the empire apart. To make matters more complicated, Franz Joseph took this opportune moment to kick the bucket and was succeeded by Charles I, who was unprepared for the role. By 1918, the empire was tearing itself apart, and despite the promises of Charles to make the empire a federation of equals, it collapsed towards the end of the year. An armistice was signed in November, but by that point, Peace, the dual monarchy had effectively ceased to exist, and Charles I entered exile, ending 600 years of Habsburg rule over Austria. In the aftermath of the First World War, the Allied powers, mostly France and Britain, signed a series of treaties which dismembered the empire. The 1990s... They were based on the Treaty of Versailles, dismembered the empire, demanded reparations, and prevented future rearmament. The Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye carved up the Austrian lands, and the 1920 Treaty of Trianon did the same to the Kingdom of Hungary. Hungary in particular suffered and lost all of this, notably Transylvania to Romania, which still contained oh, a sizable Hungarian yeah. population. Hungary had attempted to Hesper keep King, Charles as their king, no. but were forbidden by the Allies, and in the end, after a brief stint of communism, settled on a regency led, brief stint of led by Admiral Miklos Horthy. Austria tried to join Germany, but was forbidden, and so became a republic. It also lost the territory of Tyrol and Istria to the Kingdom of Italy, but this did not please the Italians, who wanted more. Many of the Slavic lands in the south were given to the newly formed Kingdom of Yugoslavia. Czechoslovakia was established, and the brand new Polish Republic gained these lands too, including the areas with a majority Ukrainian population. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire had come to an end, and with it its long rule of Habsburg monarchy. The new order set up in the wake of the collapse of the dual monarchy would only remain for about 20 years until all of the borders were redrawn again, this time mostly by the Third Reich. I hope yeah. you enjoyed this episode, and thank you for watching. There's a list of books in the description if you'd like to learn more. This was really well made. I think this is definitely one of their better paced 10 minute history videos. This one didn't feel like they were rushing. I think this amount of time period, which is like a little under 100 years, um, I think it's around 60, I think this was about 60 to 80. No, this was about 80 ish, 80 to 90 years of history. I think that's a good amount of history covered in 10 minutes. I think that was really well done. Obviously, this varies from nation to nation depending on how much happens. Right, Austro the Austro-Hungarian Empire didn't really have too much happen in the uh, as, as could have happened. Right, if we look at Germany, there's a lot of things that happen in the same time period. Um, we look at Britain, there's also a shit ton of things that happen there, but that's also because it's a globe-spanning empire. But yeah, this was honestly really well fucking paced. I loved. It. Um, that was ten minute history of the Austro-Hungarian Empire short documentary by History Matters. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.